Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to talk about Stanley Druckenmiller's $20 million bet on Bitcoin. So Stanley did a Q&A session a couple weeks ago where he talked about his evolution around Bitcoin. I don't really like to talk much about cryptocurrency on the channel. Uh, I think it's unusual to get a really thoughtful analysis of crypto, uh, particularly when it comes to investing in different cryptocurrencies. Uh, but whenever you have a top level investor like Stanley Druckenmiller talking about, you know, his thought process uh, around something like Bitcoin, I like to pay attention because it's, it's not something I feel like we can ignore anymore uh, as investors. It doesn't mean we have to buy into it, but I want to keep up on what's happening in the space. So uh, we're going to go through some of Stanley Druckenmiller's kind of key points, key thesis points around his $20 million bet. Uh, and yeah, let's dive into it. So he's asked about Bitcoin in this q and I will link to the Q&A in the description for those of you who want to get the, the full version. Uh, but he says, I've evolved on this. Five or six years ago, I said more than once, crypto and Bitcoin are a solution in search of a problem, okay? So he couldn't see the issue, the problem that cryptos were trying to address. Um, what, what the hell are these people looking for? We already have the solution. It's called the dollar, right? He didn't see why crypto was an improvement over the dollar. Uh, keep in mind, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller had made billions of dollars uh, in the capital markets. Um, right now, his net worth is like $5 billion. Okay, so someone who's, you know, very well steeped in, you know, those kind of older economics. Um, it's, you know, hard to teach a dog new tricks in some ways, but, uh, you know, he stayed open-minded. And, and we're going to talk about his evolution. Um, for the first move in Bitcoin, he says it went from around $50 to $17,000. Okay, it actually went to $20,000. Uh, and he just sat there aghast. He wanted to buy it. Uh, every day it was going up. So he had FOMO, right? He actually had ROMO, reality of missing out, as he watched this thing just go up and up and up. And of course, it dropped from 20,000 down to around 3,000. Um, and a few things happened when it dropped down to around 3,000. Uh, the first thing is the solution in search of a problem. You know, Stanley found the problem, okay? Uh, when the, in the US here, we had the CARES Act, and Jerome Powell started crossing all kinds of red lines in terms of what the Fed was willing to do. The problem was Jay Powell and the world's central bankers going nuts, okay, in the words of Druckenmiller, and making fiat money even more questionable than it had already been when Druckenmiller used to own gold, okay? So that was the first uh, thing that really got Druckenmiller interested in Bitcoin, the central bank craziness. Uh, the second thing, Druckenmiller got a call from Paul Tudor Jones. And he says, do you know that when Bitcoin went from 17,000 to 3,000, 86% of the people who owned Bitcoin at 17,000 never sold it, okay? 86% of the people who owned Bitcoin wrote it down for an 82% drop, okay? From actually 20,000 down to 3,000. Um, who the hell holds something through a drop like that? So that really got uh, Druckenmiller's attention. You've got these owners with a long-term orientation, right? They believe in the technology. They believe in Bitcoin, all right? So those, those two things really got his attention. Uh, it had a few more years under its belt. He's talking about Bitcoin, uh, goes up to 6,000, all right? So it dropped all the way down to 3,000. Now it's up at 6,000. He thought, well, I need to buy some of this because these kids on the West Coast, 
uh, are already worth more than I am. Obviously, he's exaggerating a bit there. And they'll be making a lot more money than me in the future. All right. So clearly, Druckenmiller had some FOMO um, that was was operating. And it's kind of interesting how uh, straightforward, how direct he is about experiencing that FOMO uh, to the point where it, it seems to have played in to getting him to actually take a position in Bitcoin. Uh, for some reason, they're looking at this thing the way I've always looked at gold, right? These kids are looking at Bitcoin the way Druckenmiller has always looked at gold, which is a store of value if I no longer trust fiat currencies. All right, so that's kind of the thesis there. Uh, the fact that it had been around 13 years, it had become a brand, right? So Druckenmiller sees Bitcoin as a brand. Uh, it's not just this you know, random cryptocurrency. It's actually got some brand value, some intangible value. Uh, he tried to buy $100 million worth of Bitcoin, all right? He went into this thing thinking, all right, this is how much I'm going to accumulate. And he started buying around $6,200 uh, per Bitcoin. It took two weeks to buy $20 million worth, okay? So he's only a fifth of the way into his desired position, and it's already taken two weeks to accumulate that. He thought, this is ridiculous. I can buy that much gold in two seconds, all right? So he's comparing his experience buying Bitcoin to what it would be buying gold, and it's just not, you know, it's, it's not adding up. He, he doesn't like that it's taking so long. So he says, like an idiot, I stopped buying at 20 million, only a fifth of the position that he wanted. Uh, the next thing he knew, it's trading at 36,000. Okay, so it goes from 6,500 is really where uh, he accumulated that $20 million position. Uh, and then it's up at 36,000. Now, when it hits 36,000, he took his cost out. All right. So say, you know, he, he put 20 million in. So he's selling 20 million worth of Bitcoin at 36,000. Took his cost out and then some. All right. So I don't know, maybe he's cashing out $40 million worth of Bitcoin when it hits 36,000. Uh, he says, I still own some. My heart has never been in it. All right. This was really just a FOMO play, uh, a bet that he made because he thought it was going to go up and he was tired of sitting on the sidelines. Um, he says, I'm a 68-year-old dinosaur, okay? And that's part of why his heart's just never been in it. It's not something I guess he can really uh, wrap his head around or get excited about this, this Bitcoin uh, technology. Once it started moving and all these institutions started adopting it, I could see the old elephant trying to get through the keyhole, all right? So you've got this thing where there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoins in existence, okay? So a fixed supply, and that supply is actually diminishing uh, over time. Obviously, there's still Bitcoin being mined, um, but, you know, when people lose their Bitcoin, like the story of the guy who had his keys for his Bitcoin on his computer, the computer somehow ended up in the landfill. Uh, and of course, he could never find it. So, uh, you know, people lose their keys all the time, so they can't access their Bitcoin. It's effectively gone. All right. So, you know, 21 million is if everyone uh, keeps, you know, access to their keys and their Bitcoin. Obviously, uh, that's diminished some over time. Uh, and then he says, so right, the old elephant trying to get through the keyhole, this fixed supply and all this big institutional money trying to get their hands on Bitcoin, where you've got 86% of the owners who aren't willing to sell. So there's uh, a lot more demand than there is supply, which I guess is why Druckenmiller thinks it, it shot up so much. Um now, Druckenmiller says he owns this company called Palantir. Okay, most of us are familiar with Palantir. And they announced they will start accepting Bitcoin, right? And this is happening all over the place. You've got Tesla uh, putting some of the balance sheet into Bitcoin. Uh, there's just more and more 
institutional level players getting into the space. Uh, because it's a brand that's been around for 14 years, because of the finite supply, it has won the store of value game. Okay, that's what Druckenmiller says about, you know, you've got digital gold. All right, that's, that's the store of value in the cryptocurrency space. Druckenmiller thinks Bitcoin, uh, it's going to be really tough to unseat Bitcoin in that kind of digital gold store of value uh, corner of cryptocurrencies. Uh, then you get to commerce facilitators. Ethereum would be the one that's leading at this stage. There, I'm a little more skeptical as to whether they can hold their position. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. It reminds me of MySpace before Facebook or Yahoo before Google came along. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of where he sees Ethereum. It's obviously got an early uh, advantage. It's got the lead. Um, but he thinks with all of these really smart uh, students coming out of Stanford and MIT and these other technical schools really uh, moving into that space, really interested in the space of cryptocurrency, he thinks uh, Ethereum is likely to be disrupted by some project, by some team coming out of one of these universities that doesn't even exist yet, okay? So that's, that's his take on Ethereum, much more risky uh, than, than Bitcoin. One of the ways we've always invested in the private sector is to try to figure out where the engineering kids from Stanford and Brown and MIT, where those kids are going, okay? And so many of them are going into the crypto space. So many of them are in love with crypto, right? It's, they're passionate about crypto in a way that Druckenmiller just is not. Uh, there's a good chance that the project that will dominate commerce facilitation hasn't even been invented yet, right? So that's, that's what I just said. Uh, as long as Jerome Powell keeps acting the way he's acting, Bitcoin as high beta gold, which is kind of an interesting way to frame uh, Bitcoin will have the wind behind it. So he thinks, you know, there's tailwinds as long as the Fed continues to print money, to throw money, uh, to keep the markets uh, elevated, right? To keep them afloat in a sense. And he talks briefly about Dogecoin. Uh, he doesn't have any FOMO around Dogecoin. Dogecoin has a, doesn't have a limited supply, Okay. So he just doesn't see uh, any kind of investment case for Dogecoin. It's really just one of these meme uh, type speculative bets uh, that Elon Musk has been pumping and, and others. But uh, Dogecoin does not give him FOMO. Um, and presumably Bitcoin doesn't give him FOMO anymore as well, although he certainly wishes he would have plowed that whole $100 million into Bitcoin instead of just $20 million. But, you know, I presume uh, Druckenmiller will maintain a position in Bitcoin and, and ride it uh, for a number of years, which is similar to my approach. I bought at around 9000 uh, and, you know, it wasn't $20 million. It was a, a very small piece of uh, my investment pie, really just to have some exposure to, to Bitcoin and a few other cryptocurrencies, not even really as an investment, um, just to, you know, one, to have some exposure, also to encourage myself to learn more about the space, to have some skin in the game, to have a bit of an ownership mindset around Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and a few others. Um, but certainly it was money that I was completely willing to lose if, if all of that went to zero. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, we've got more and more of these, you know, great value investors who are coming out of the woodwork, taking some initial positions in Bitcoin and kind of sharing their rationale for doing so. So something I'm watching uh, let me know what you guys have seen from great investors who have shared, you know, what they're seeing uh, in different cryptocurrencies. I think
think Ray Dalio took a position recently. I haven't read anything that he's put out on his rationale behind that. I know he's talked a little bit about Bitcoin in the past. Um, but it's an interesting time, guys. It's going to be really interesting to see you know, the evolution, uh, particularly in the um, commerce facilitation space uh, within cryptos to see, you know, who are the dominant players uh, that come out of that uh, if it's not going to be Ethereum. You know, that's going to be very interesting to watch. And can Bitcoin, can Bitcoin really hold on over the next decade or two in terms of its dominance um, being the digital gold of choice uh, for investors. So anyway, guys, just wanted to share my two cents on Stanley Druckenmiller's recent q and I will link to that in the description. And uh, hopefully I'm not going to get a ton of spam because I'm putting out a video on Bitcoin and cryptos. You know, there's all these daisy chain comments that kind of come out whenever I do something like this. So I'll try to stay on top of, you know, blocking the spam that comes out just to keep it somewhat organized down there in the comments for all of you. But let me know what you guys think uh, about Bitcoin and Ethereum. If you're dabbling in the space uh, and, and what you're seeing out there. All right, guys, that's all I got for today. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.